This is a retrospective look back on Ape Escape. The opening scene shows our yet unknown protagonist chasing a monkey through an endless green field with a comically large net. There's clear blue skies as the upbeat opening theme plays. Right off the bat, the music is great. It do be hitting different, as the zoomers say. It also does a perfect job setting the game's tone. This is Spike, the previously mentioned protagonist, and his friend, Jake. They're excited to see the professor, as he's almost finished with a time machine. They race to his lab, which is a nod to a rivalry that'll play out later in the story. The scene of them arriving at the professor's lab is really well done, but you'll miss it if you're not paying attention. The road to the lab is exaggerated in its circular shape, as is the lab building itself. Both of these are probably inspired by Dragon Ball, particularly the Capsule Court building. I also really like the scene transition. It's like a large mechanical door opening. I think this is what people mean when they say a game has soul. It's a really good first impression. This is the professor and his assistant slash granddaughter, Natalie, or Katie if you're British. They've been captured by some apes who start up the Finnish time machine and hijinks ensue. Spike and Jake get transported to parts unknown as this smug ape smugly fades to white. Smugly. I super like the character designs. Reminds me of Mega Man Legends and just screams PlayStation 1. They all have vivid expressions and animated gestures that make up for the lack of detail given the technology at the time. Spike, can you hear me? You must listen carefully. Something awful has happened. The professor contacts us over a video call to let us know how irresponsible he is and how this is all his fault. Thanks, professor. Turns out that smug ape is Spectre, the leader of the apes. He sent his ape army back in time in order to change history and ensure world domination. We get swept up in the time machine along with a time net and stun club. So anyway, this is Casey, the professor's AI assistant. Wait a minute, what the f- So Ape Escape will use the terms monkey and ape interchangeably. It doesn't really matter, so why am I still talking about it? Casey will help us before every level by showing us how many monkeys we need to capture in order to progress to the next stage. I'm gonna give a disclaimer. I don't generally enjoy platformers, so maybe this is normal, but I love how every level starts via some opening shots showing off the area you're about to explore. Throughout the game, we'll run into these mailboxes that explain the game's controls, mechanics, new gadgets we collect, and other useful information. This starting level is basically a tutorial, so it's a good introductory space that allows us to get a feel for the game before putting us in any real danger. We use the face buttons to select our gadget, R2 and R2 to jump, which you get used to very quickly, and there's also a double jump. L1 will center the camera behind you, which you'll use frequently. L2 enters a first person mode, but you can't move. The left stick moves and the right stick moves your selected gadget in the direction that it was pressed. For example, pressing it right swings your net to the right. It still feels unique today because games don't usually use positional controls like this. You can also click in the left analog stick, otherwise known as L3, to crawl. Fun fact about the crawl, entering a crawl dampens the music. We'll use this to sneak up on monkeys and or apes. Lowering the music while doing that is just another neat touch and it wouldn't surprise me if lots of people miss that. Checking out our HUD, we have monkeys bottom right. If they're uncaptured, they're just the pick of a monkey, but captured, they become a net sprite. T-shirts bottom left, that's our lives. Top left are cookies, our health. Then we have golden triangle coins top of the screen. Collect 100 of them and you get another life. Ape Escape is a pretty relaxed platformer. I think it's up there with Kirby in terms of difficulty, so don't sweat the lives. Spike will also automatically grab onto ledges if you're close enough, which will save you from falling. The monkeys in this first level are just hanging out, so they're easy to catch. They'll run from you if spotted, but you're faster than them. That'll change in later levels. There are also these little enemies here. The wiki calls them Natsuns? Natsuns? I'm not sure. They don't have any in-game lore that I know of, but they'll hit you if you get too close. You can beat them with your club and they'll pop out some coins. The game has some reasons to backtrack, such as monkeys and specter coins you can't reach until you get gadgets from later levels, but none of it is necessary to progress. Speaking of gadgets, the time net allows us to capture apes and send them back to the present, while the stun club lets us stun apes before capturing. Though it just makes it easier, it's not mandatory to use. The art design for this first level is pretty cute. There's a crashed rocket ship with Spectre's face on it embedded into the side of the mountain, as well as massive dinosaur footprints in the grass. After capturing the necessary amount of apes in a level, you are automatically transported back to the professor's lab. I don't like this. There's several reasons why you'll want to stay in a level. Capturing more apes, collecting more coins or specter coins, or just exploring more of the level for fun. 
I would have preferred an option to jump to the next level or head back to the lab rather than the game making that choice for me. You can head back to any previously unlocked level at any time, so it's not a huge deal, but it does mean more loading screens for no real reason. The lab is the hub you'll always return to after a level. You don't really have to engage with it, but you should. There's a gadget practice area, a place to save, and a mini games corner. These mini games are pretty crazy. They're not in the game's story, you'll never come across them. You unlock them via collecting the large specter coins. They're skiing, boxing, and a twin stick space shooter. These games have no business being as good as they are. They're fully fleshed out arcade games. They have their own unique assets, music, great controls, and are just fun to play. I personally like the skiing. You use the left analog stick for the left ski and right for right. The game had more than enough content without them, so it's really cool they're in here. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Back to the main game. The levels are split up into zones, all fitting a specific theme. The first are three levels revolving around every cool kid's obsession. Dinosaurs. Appropriately titled, The Lost Land. Look what I've got! A new gadget! Check it out! This is the water net. Before starting the second level of the first zone, we're given a water net. It's a slightly misleading name, because although it can shoot a water net, it's more like a sea bob, which is one of those things you've probably seen in movies or Subnautica. Before getting a new gadget, we have to complete a brief tutorial. This thing allows us to swim underwater pretty quickly. It can also capture monkeys in the water. Ape Escape does a great job at slowly introducing challenges at the same rate it does new mechanics. This level is just a tiny bit more difficult than the last. It brings with it a moving platform and water as an obstacle. Molten Lava, the third and final level of this zone, ramps things up even more. Now there's not just water, but a waterfall. Wow. We also have level edges that'll hurt us if we fall off. I like this monkey doing a handstand. Oh, and a new enemy type. You know the Octoroks from Breath of the Wild? These guys are generally the same. There's also a cute pterodactyl nest section. A monkey hides under the cracked eggshells, so you have to hit them and nab them before the bird can hit you. Ape Escape really excels at executing these fun ideas. You can tell the designers were having a lot of fun thinking up ways to catch monkeys. The levels are often broken up via very short loading screens. The next little zone has a monkey riding a T-Rex. We can get the T-Rex to charge the rocks, hitting his head and knocking the little bugger off, marking the end to the level. I don't care for the next zone's theme. Mysterious Age doesn't have anything strongly tying the themes together like the previous one, but the level design makes up for it by being pretty awesome. Oh, and we get the best gadget in the game, a monkey radar. A single gadget immediately removes any need for mindlessly running around trying to find that last monkey. I hate games that waste my time and demand that I run around searching for something. God bless Ape Escape. This level is also the first time we'll see this spinning wheel contraption. You hit it multiple times with your stun club and it'll open doors. We'll be seeing a lot more of these later. I don't think we can beat this monster tree yet. Or at least I don't know how and I never figured it out. As far as I know, there's no way to get to this 8 before they reach the UFO. And once they're in, it's hell. You can come back here later when you have a slingshot gadget, but it's better to just time it right and hit them with your club. And now the professor is incredibly excited about sending us into what's basically Kong Island. Before we get started though, Spectre calls in so we can get some lore. The professor recognizes him as the performing monkey from an amusement park. You're the monkey that performs at the amusement park. What? Do they have monkeys at amusement parks? It's been a while what with COVID, but I don't think that's a thing. Anyway, he ended up with an intelligence boosting helmet the professor was working on. Spectre then made mass produced copies for his ape armies, hence the helmets and the iconic design. Oh, and we also learn that Jake, remember him? Well, he's been brainwashed and is now working for Spectre. It's hilarious how many lines Natalie gets. What's happening? What's wrong with you? Do you realize what you're saying? Do you know who you're talking to? Snap out of it. Okay, I get it. I have a hot take. Ape Escape has cutscenes that rival Metal Gear Solid. I think everything except the voice acting and cinematography is better. The characters' animations in particular are fantastic. Their eyebrows furrow when angry, eyes get wide when surprised, their arms gesture far more and in more realistic ways, even their mouths open and close when speaking. All these things are just better. It's so much fun to watch, something I never thought I'd say or even thought about until really watching these cutscenes. I still love Metal Gear Solid, but it makes me really appreciate Ape Escape and what they did with so little. So remember when I said this game had amazing music? Well, we're about to break that trend in this next level.
kill me. I like the pitcher plants and the first monkey hiding in them. You can hit them with your club, but it's more fun to use the radar. This level is the largest yet, with a few different zones separated by very brief loading screens. I say loading screen, but this is the entire thing. I mentioned not liking this zone's theme, and that's because it's basically prehistoric stuff, but fantasy. I don't know, personal preference I guess. It feels like generic video game enemies, human sized plants that'll eat you, big catfish, bland forest environment, meh. Oh and there's also the raft, by far the worst vehicle in the game. There's vehicles in this game by the way. It's not unbearable or anything, and it controls right stick right paddle, left stick left paddle, which is cool, but I didn't find it fun to use. More frustrating than anything else really. So one really cool thing about this monkey radar I forgot to mention. While aiming it at apes, you can hit L2 and get info about the monkeys. Their names are fun to read, as are a one sentence tidbit you get about them. They're always something cheeky like Spectre's favorite. They even have stats speed, attack, and alertness. The helmets on their heads inform you of their behavior. Blue is their relaxed state, yellow is alert and investigating, and red is alarmed. It's stealth game centric stuff, but there's more. Their pants also signify their personalities. Why is that so hard to say? Personalities. Okay, strap in. Yellow are the most common. These monkeys are easy peasy. Light blue are quick to spook, but also pretty easy. Black have guns. Blue are fast, green shoot missiles out of backpacks and have high awareness. Red are smart and also have guns. And white are extremely on edge. They all have skill levels ranging from 1 to 7. It's not a massive deal on how hard they are to catch, but they do behave noticeably differently. Each ape sometimes can be kind of a mini puzzle. Some can be solved multiple ways. Some require one way to solve. Ape Escape feels a lot like a puzzle game sometimes. Despite being in the same zone, I appreciate how the different levels vary so much. While we're still in the mysterious age zone, it's so open compared to the last level. Jumping on these platforms in the sky, the feel is completely different, and it keeps the game feeling fresh and new. The levels also never overstay their welcome, thanks in part to their small size and the monkey radar ensuring you're never too lost. The second stage also introduces a new enemy type, and the ability to push blocks, revealing more pathways. It's doing that thing that good games do, where you slowly introduce new mechanics, then build on those as things progress. This level also has a large indoor environment that's pretty neato. There are these thin beams you can walk across, but here's the thing. You know in modern games how when you shimmy across a beam or catwalk or something, you'll enter a unique animation for that action? And how it's usually really hard to fall or fail it? Well in Ape Escape, you simply gently tilt the analog stick in the direction and Spike will tiptoe carefully in that direction. That's it. The act of moving across dangerous terrain has the same level of player control at all times. Never does the game say, hey player, listen buddy, you're probably a casual who will fail this. And rather than let you get frustrated, we're going to give you water wingies. But joking aside, there's something so refreshing about a game showing you, hey, here's your character and the moves they can perform. Okay, now use that mobility to tackle these physical challenges. And it just keeps that consistent throughout. It makes you feel so much more connected, and the achievements you do within the game, so much more rewarding. Imagine if you played Uncharted, and instead of Nate entering a shimmy animation across a ledge, you had to do that given his normal movement animations. The Souls games are actually a really good example of this. There's perilous environments all throughout those games, and you always navigate them with the same movement you have at the start. It gets progressively harder as the game goes on, but it never fundamentally changes. Sure, you get items and stat boosts to help you, but there's never a context-based animation to help you with any of the environmental challenges. Next level gives us the super hoop. It makes you run fast and has a wind up, and it's fitting because the next level is a tropical beach. I love the sunny and pretty environment, not so much the crippling frame drops. There's a lot going on here. I double checked and it's just how the game ran at the time thanks to the PlayStation hardware. Not a huge issue as it's only when facing the entire beach zone, which is a pretty small part of the level. Time for a gross level, as we find a new dinosaur and vore ourselves. Not a fan of body grossness. I'm pretty sure we did the same thing in Ocarina of Time and Lost Planet too, funny enough. It's imaginative at least. Bones, meat, blocks, even half a ship. We also get a slingshot which we can use to interact with switches and knock these monkeys off whatever in God's name this thing is. The monkeys aren't too difficult, but they're good slingshot practice. Next zone is the Ice Age, and we didn't even bring a coat. Why are there murder snowmen here? You're thinking too hard. Let me direct your attention instead to this monkey in these igloos. No? Well how about this woolly mammoth then? This ice level is neat, but I'm confused by the machinery. The professor mentioned the monkeys are adapting well, so I assume they built this? Are they going back in time and building infrastructure? That's pretty scary. 
We do a sneaky and nab enough monkeys to move on. The professor gives us a sky flyer. It's a pedal that we whip around really fast and it gives us some extra lift. We can also gently fall while using it too. This is one of, if not the most useful gadget in my opinion. A gadget that allows you to jump higher and slowly drift to the ground is useful in a platformer. Shocking, I know. Ape Escape does two great things that I think are a big reason for its success. Number one, the gadgets and movements all feel great. They really nail it, and that's of course critical for a platformer. The second is the game's atmosphere and attention to detail. Just look at this ice cave. The dripping water from the icicles above, the shimmering sunbeams, and the bats flapping around, as well as the ice crystals sprinkled throughout the ice cave. It's a bunch of little things that you don't really notice on their own, coming together to add to that buzzword again, soul. Ape Escape is bursting at the seams with it. I think if you create art with passion, people will notice. The devs were clearly passionate about this game and you can see it when you play. I had a lot of fun making this video and I hope that shows through. Whatever you do, be passionate about it. People will notice. Final level of this zone is called New Friesland. Unfortunately, New Zealand exists in the Ape Escape lore. That's the second most frustrating thing I've experienced today. The first being this ice bridge. It collapses as you run on it, so you gotta also use the super hoop, while also avoiding the chain balls. It's one of the first times I felt frustrated in this game, which is surprising considering how bad I am at platformers. I don't generally enjoy them that much. They're okay. I think that speaks a lot to Ape Escape's design. The end part of this level makes up for the ice bridge though. There's Japanese hot springs, and the water spout thing is even a monkey. Here we see Luza, unbothered, moisturized, happy, in their lane, and thriving. Oh, and we got them. So three times throughout the game, once you complete all the levels in the zone, you'll have a chance to do these races against Jake. He's far quicker at jumping, but a slow runner. You don't have to win them, but they're a nice change of pace. Ape Escape's low-key design philosophy seems to be keep it moving and keep it fun. You're never stuck in one place doing any one thing for too long. Speaking of which, the professor found Spectre's time period. The dawn of human civilization, which Ape Escape thinks is Feudal Japan, based on the next level being a Feudal Japan level. Pretty sure that's not accurate. Thanks to my intro to anthropology class in college, I have the authority to say human civilization began by building simple shelters via bones and other animal parts tens of thousands of years ago. Look, see? Wait, that's not old looking enough. There we go. Regardless of the historical inaccuracies, this might be my favorite zone. I'm a sucker for feudal Japan. It's a large reason why I live and work in Japan today. Games like this implanted a dream in my head to go out and see the world. The media you consume in your formative years has such a profound effect on your desires and personality as you mature. Also, I like the part where you jump down the well. I just saw it and thought, I could jump it. It's a lava well, unfortunately. It's basically Bowser's castle down here. There's two monkeys to nab and a massive stone statue of Spectre. I also love the chains and red carpeting, hinting at it being a throne room or something. So much personality and detail. There's the lower part with the lava, but then you can climb up towards the ceiling, which has broken pillars, hanging fire lanterns, vines you can shimmy across, and dangling chains. It's atmospheric, so let's just take a second to soak it in. Our last monkey is in the walls. Hit this button to reveal a traditional Japanese room. There's a little dresser, tatami flooring, and a kotatsu table. All very cute. The next level is based on the Great Wall of China, and after that, a medieval castle. We have the trifecta of medieval Japan, China, and then Europe. The last is by far the largest level I've played yet. There's multiple environments in and around the castle. The objective is to capture Spectre, but I have a feeling it won't be happening so soon. There really is a ton here. You can run around the castle, on top of the castle, and go inside the castle. Then inside, there are even more sectioned off mini levels everywhere, including a dungeon section underground. Inside, there's a throne room with a monkey sitting atop it wearing some bitchin' sunglasses, but no Spectre. Finally making our way to the top tower of the castle, and we find Jake and Spectre. I haven't played Elden Ring, but I'm assuming this boss fight is basically the same experience. This big guy is the only true boss fight I can think of in the entire game so far. It's super mechanically simple, but as you probably know by now, I like when games change things up. It's so simple that I thought you had to shoot these things on the ceiling. Turns out, nope, you just dodge, then hit. Whoa, Casey can talk. Just finished evaluating the new gadget for the professor. She gives us an RC car. Do y'all remember when Duke Nukem Forever finally came out, and the only somewhat neat part about it was the RC car? 
Yeah, it's like that, but way, way better. Also, Ape Escape did it 12 years earlier. The RC car is nice because it can hit switches, collect items, and even stun monkeys. Super useful. We'll use it a bunch in the first level of the new zone. The first part is green and kind of pretty, but then we move underground into an industrial area. It's well done in terms of layout, but it feels super oppressive and just isn't a pleasant space to be in. It does not spark joy. The next level introduces a tank. It uses similar controls to the raft, but given that we're on land, is far easier to control. There's even destructible environments in the form of these specific walls. Inside Spectre's lab and things get real sci-fi-y. There's all kinds of obstacles and hazards. It's a bit sad finishing the level though, as there's no Natalie to congratulate you. It's a small reminder of what's at stake. I wish the game had more story overall. The middle section and meat of the game really does feel a bit empty. Fun levels and gameplay, but too little story. Next, we're on to the TV tower with the goal of finally catching the big monkey himself. This level is a culmination of everything we've learned so far. There's a water section, plenty of platforming. The raft and tank both return as well. The monkeys are a little more difficult too, but we finally make it to the top and find Spectre for a final showdown. This is a real boss battle in that there's patterns and even a weak point. It's not difficult though, just time consuming. You gotta shoot the green weak point while dodging his flamethrower and UFOs. Oh, and did I say the final showdown? Well, tough luck, because this ending likes to drag, which means this video will too. Strap in. The Maybe Final Levels theme is a theme park themed around Spectre. It's a Spectre-themed theme park, and I could smell my brain melting. Hey look, it's the Professor! Hi, Professor! This level is broken up into attractions. The first is freeing the Professor, and is a bit like a circus, I guess. It's okay. I don't really like circuses, though, so yeah. We climb into the Professor's cage, but have to kill it first. You've gotten stronger. Thanks to your gadgets, Professor. No, the gadgets don't contain any real power. It's all in how you were able to use them. The true power is inside of you, Spike. You've grown. You've learned a lot and you've truly become stronger. Aw, it's some character development. The more I hear of the voice acting, the worse it becomes. But it really depends on the cutscene. The next themed area is Western. Oh boy, it's not very good. That's my hard-hitting critique analysis review brought to you by Pringles. The music's not very good either. And it's also one of the few times I've actually died in the game. Maybe the second ever? The monkeys all have guns and bully me, and I'm straight up not having a good time, bro. I do like how you can see the stage lights up high, though. That's a nice touch. I almost forgot to mention, but I love this zone's main theme. It's so annoyingly good. I'm going for it. Gonna make this my ringtone or something. Hey, look, an arcade. Hey look, a roller coaster. Yeah, not a fan of this part either. You gotta jump to avoid the obstacles. It goes really fast, but we get through it and find Natalie. Next is the haunted house. Now this part does in fact spark joy. I love anything Halloween themed. Always have and always will. We collect enough monkeys, which somehow frees Natalie, who's very happy to be free. Now, where is Spectre? I haven't found him yet. What about Jake? Nope. Ah. Oh. What have you been doing all this time? Let's go, we've got to find them. Where are you going? I'm going back to the lab. We can't find them or beat them without our equipment. Besides, you don't need me here. Ah! What was that? Ah! We're off to the go-karts to challenge Jake and battle for his soul. Despite the name, this is an incredibly lame and easy boss battle. He sends out RC cars, you destroy them, then you hit his weak point. No racing or bumping, lame. With Jake's soul saved, it's time for the real final showdown. We climb up and finally reach Spectre. Having the final boss be from the boss's point of view is pretty unique, right? Don't know if I've seen a game do that before. It's easy, but in true game fashion, this guy has multiple life bars and multiple forms. His robot form is far harder and causes low frame rates. I'm assuming from the number of particles on screen. This boss battle looks fantastic for a PS1 game. The textures, lots of polygons on the robot, the smaller flying robots, and of course, all the effects. I'm not especially familiar with PS1 games. It was the first console I technically owned as a kid, but this was pre-internet, so all of my knowledge came from gaming magazines and what my friends were playing. But I do get this feeling that this really pushed what the PlayStation was capable of in terms of technology. The low frame rate in spots could be due to incompetent devs, but this game is extremely well made, so I doubt that's true. I also base this hunch on the fact that Ape Escape came out at the tail end of the PlayStation's lifespan. After defeating him, Spike tells Spectre he's taking him back to the amusement park, where he used to perform, which freaks Spectre out. 
Understandably so, right? I'm taking you back to the amusement park. You must be joking. You're not taking me anywhere. I'll never go back. I'm never going back to that rotten place. You listen, and you listen good. I will return, and when I do, I'll destroy you and the world as you know it. So you better be ready, because next time, I won't fail. Makes me feel bad for him. Like, what the fuck, Spike? He's clearly traumatized by this. Feels bad. Spectre tells Spike he'll be back and disappears into time. A post-credits epilogue scene taking place at the park Spectre used to perform at has the characters reaffirming their drive to capture Spectre and put an end to his plans, setting up both a sequel and backtracking, which you can do now that the story has completed. So how is Ape Escape? Well, it's not surprising it became a cult classic. I think the most surprising part about it is the lack of modern appeal. Yeah, there are sequels and tie-ins, but Sony just kinda let it die over a long period of time. I'm assuming the sales must have dragged, and maybe the quality of later games did too. I intend to find that out in the future. It's also not nearly as deep as something like Super Mario 64, so I can see it being a one and done deal. The skill ceiling is pretty low. Regardless, it does what it set out to do, and has held up exceptionally well. I had fun, and am glad I got to see it through. The characters are simplistic but likable, genuine and memorable. The monkeys are comedic, which is a pretentious way of saying funny. The level design is inspired with tremendous imagination. The gadgets are interesting and a joy to use. The controls are smooth and the soundtrack. Oh baby, the soundtrack. What I'm trying to say is, Ape Escape isn't just good, it's great. It set out to be an adventure a child would dream up, and it's successful. Thanks for watching.